Good morning, everybody. Today is August 24th. I'm Joanne Kuntz. I'm here with my partner, Jackie Durham, and we've got a real page turner for you today. Um, <laughs> today, we're going to talk to you about restrictive covenants and other considerations. Um, Jackie spends a good bit of her day um, sitting in the space of business purchases and sales, people buying and selling businesses, um, whether they're asset purchases or stock purchases. Um, and some of these restrictions, uh, restrictive covenants are um, critical pieces of how we get these deals put together and how we paper them in a way that is um, going to protect our clients. So um, without further ado, I want to hand it over to you, but first I'd like an English translation, if you don't mind, of <laughs> what a restrictive, what does that even mean? What is a restrictive covenant? So restrictive covenants is just a fancy way of describing provisions and a contract that protect certain intangible rights that protect uh, your customer base, your employees. So there are things like non-competes, um, which essentially restrict a, an employee from recruiting their former employees to leave your business and come join them at their new place of employment or their new business that they've started up. It also will uh, prevent a business seller from competing with a business purchaser when they go and, um, you know, complete the closing of the business. And uh, it also, you know, can, it can be included in certain independent contractor agreements as well. Um, now, whether or not those can actually be enforceable sometimes is a matter of how they're crafted, but you might see those between a uh, broker and an agent. Um, even though it's an independent contractor relationship, sometimes those broker will, you know, the brokers will impose the non-competition provision. So um, that's a non-compete. That's one of the most common restrictive covenants that I think most people are aware of um, to some extent. There's also a uh, non-solicitation, which is a really important one that is often overlooked. And this restricts a employee or, <clears throat> or a uh, former business owner or whoever you might have the relationship with, whatever the contract relationship may be from soliciting your customers um, and from soliciting your employees. And then lastly, there is a non-disclosure restrictive covenant, which restricts certain parties from disclosing your confidential business information and trade secrets. Um, that is another one that I would say is probably really, really crucial, but maybe the most overlooked restrictive covenant that can really serve your business well if you have it in place. So those are what we mean when we're referring to restrictive covenants. And um, I'll say really that- and that's a really big description. So um, it's nice yeah. to have a little bit of a breakdown. <laughs> right. It, co it covers a lot. And I, I will say that today we're not going to dive deep and I'm not going to give you the guts of these restrictive covenants and what exactly they need to look like. First of all, because we only have an hour. And second of all, because they really are going to vary based on the particular facts and circumstances surrounding the, the business industry, um, the parties to the agreement. Um, you know, they can really look very different agreement to agreement. And I've noticed that some clients tend to have a restrictive covenant that maybe they, they had in an employment agreement and they plug that in into another contract. Uh, and that can be a really big mistake because part of, of enforcing a restrictive covenant is ensuring that it is tailored to that particular contract and the particular parties. If it's overreaching, it can be rendered unenforceable. So it's really, really crucial that you make sure that you're working with an attorney with each agreement where you contemplate some kind of restrictive covenant, because it's not a one size fits all clause that you can just shove in any given contract. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll go over that a, a little bit later in the webinar, but um, just opening with that, because I, sure. I tend to see that happen. So, um, <clears throat> so what I would start with is, you know, when I'm talking to clients about these restrict restrictive covenants, most clients think, oh, you know, I, I would, I don't have an employment agreement in place right now. Um, you know, those really only belong in employment agreements. And I think that that is a big mistake. Um, you know, people are very quick and don't think twice about insuring their tangible personal property and their equipment. But you also, as a business owner, need to consider how you're going to protect your valuable business information and trade secrets. Uh, oftentimes, these protections come as sort of an afterthought once the intangible business property, whether it be 
um, an invention or a design or a software coding, something like that, after you've created it and it has some value that is either able to be licensed to purchasers or sold off um, to an investor, that's when you sort of start thinking about the protection of this asset. By that point in time, it's too late. You really need to think about how you're going to protect those kinds of assets in advance um, and working with an attorney to, to craft those protections is, is crucial. So what I want to do is kind of go through some of the common circumstances where your antenna needs to go up and you need to kind of think about what you need to put in place to protect those intangible rights and your customer base and your employees. Uh, the list I'm going to go through is not exhaustive. So I still recommend that, you know, when you're entering into any kind of agreement or relationship with another party where they're going to gain access to valuable business information, you need to, you need to get on the phone with your attorney and ask them, do they think that you need some kind of non-disclosure, non-solicitation agreement in place before you open the door to that particular individual or company? This can be independent contractors, this can be manufacturers, distributors. Um, you know, it, it really can extend to a lot of different parties that people off the cuff would not expect to be in a position to utilize or misappropriate their business information, but they very much will be. So um, again, these are conversations to have in advance of opening those doors. Yeah. So um, the first circumstance that you touched on, Joanne, is a business sale. And this is really important because, and it's, it's important to make sure these restrictive covenants are crafted in favor of both the buyer and the seller. What I will say is I commonly see a non-compete clause in a business contract, but just having a non-compete clause alone is going to fall short, especially if you're the buyer. So if you have a non-compete clause that says that the seller agrees not to compete and perform, you know, the same business within a certain radius uh, for, you know, a particular period of time, that is protective to a point, but that's not going to stop the seller from disseminating or selling the valuable business information that you have essentially paid fair market value for when you purchase the business. It also won't necessarily stop the seller from poaching your customers and your employees. All they have to do is step outside that non-compete territory and they can work with your customers, employees, and they can solicit them and they can use your, um, you know, they can use the valuable business concepts and information that they've cultivated over the years before now selling to you. And they're actually acting in competition with you, but they're not bound by anything because it falls outside of the restrictive non-compete territory. So that's why, you know, typically if I'm representing a buyer, I have to come in and really beef up those restrictive covenants because they typically fall short of actually protecting the buyer after the closing. Um, likewise, the seller, if you're selling a business, before you lift up the skirt and let this buyer take a look at your valuable business information and relationships and customer lists and employee information, you need to make sure that either if you're, if you're allowing the buyer to conduct their due diligence in advance of signing the contract, you need to have a standalone uh, non-solicitation, non-disclosure agreement in place before they see anything. Or if they're going to be conducting their due diligence after going under contract, you just want to make sure that all of that info, all of those restricted covenants are provided for in the contract to make sure in the event that this buyer does not proceed with the purchase, that they don't then misappropriate that information that you've just shared with them about your business and go utilize it in the operation of a, of a competing business. Yeah. So that's the first, the first uh, circumstance I wanted to touch on. Um, <clears throat> another one that I feel like a lot of folks don't necessarily think about on the front end is when you're entering into a business relationship, like a partnership, when you're forming an LLC or a corporation with another person and you go into this, you know, best buds and you have high hopes for everything and you don't, it's not intuitive to think that that person might later compete with you because you guys come in as partners. Mm -hmm. Why would that person compete with their own business? The problem is business partnerships dissolve. And what you want to make sure is that you have certain conditions in place when you're walking into this, whether it be a separate non-compete, non-solicitation, non-disclosure agreement, or 
if your company documents, your operating agreement or your shareholders agreement or your partnership agreement contemplate these restrictions. Um, because what can happen is if you go to dissolve that partnership or that relationship, you now have to negotiate those restrictions on the back end and parties are not always cooperative and they can drag out for years. And I'm involved in a negotiation involving that circumstance right now. And it's not pretty. I will say that there are, <clears throat> there are certain uh, fiduciary laws that extend to business owners, meaning that if I own a business with Joanne, I can't go out and open up a competing business um, depending on a certain number of factors. The percentage of ownership plays into it. If you're a minority shareholder, you might not have the same fiduciary obligations as a majority shareholder. Uh, but typically, if you're involved in the um, active management of the business, that fiduciary duty is going to extend to you. But it's not a hard and fast rule that you can point to. So it's really going to benefit you to have those restrictions in place in an agreement that is signed by both parties rather than relying on the uh, Florida laws regarding fiduciary duties between business owners. So it's just best practices to get that in writing up front. Um, obviously, <clears throat> we touched on at the beginning of this hiring of an employee. It's uh, obviously crucial to make sure you have a non-compete provision in there. And I would go as far as including the confidentiality and uh, non-disclosure aspects of that. And you also want to make sure that you're including an assignment of any kind of intangible property that that employee creates on your behalf while they're employed. Many employers assume that if I have hired you and I'm paying you to help me create this invention um, software, you, you assume that that property belongs to you, but that's not always the case with inventions. So you need to be really careful to make sure that whatever agreement you have with that employee not only are they agreeing not to disclose your confidential information or compete with you or poach your employees or customers, uh, but you also want to make sure that they are specifically assigning their rights in any inventions or trademarks or other intellectual property that they create on your behalf to your company specifically. Um, that will save you a lot of uh, headache down the road um, if and when you, you know, need to license certain property to other users or sell to an investor. Um, one of the first things that investors look at when they come to buy out a business is, okay, here's the intangible property that carries some value in this business that we're paying for, this trademark, this invention, whatever it may be. They want to see who created it and what was the agreement between you as the seller and the individual that created it. Even if they're an employee, if that employment agreement doesn't have the right provision about assigning those intangible property rights, that's going to be less attractive to your investors. And you will find yourself in a position where you might be going to, with your hand out to a former employee saying, hey, remember that that um, software that you uh, prepared on, on behalf of our company six years ago? Well, we would like you to, to assign and waive your rights to that. Well, at that point, that former employee is going to gain a lot of interest in what they might be paid um, mm -hmm. to compensate them for waiving or relinquishing those rights. So you want to cover it on the front end and not on the back end because it can get really expensive. Um, the, the next item I would touch on is independent contractors. They're a little different from employees and that literally whether it's a trademark or a patented invention, no matter what it is, if you have an independent contractor who is performing services or creating something on your behalf, if you've commissioned them to create something, that technically, that intellectual property right is is the right of the independent contractor. Mm -hmm. They, in exchange for what you have paid them, are essentially essentially just licensing to you whatever they've created, whether that be a website or a software, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. you don't actually own the rights to that. The independent contractor does unless there is an agreement specifically assigning those rights to you. So it's even more crucial when you're working with an independent contractor to make sure that you are specifically having those rights assigned to you and also that you're having the same non-disclosure and non-solicitation put in place because those independent contractors are gonna come into contact with your valuable confidential business information. They're going to come into contact with your employees and potentially even your customers. And uh, this, this also extends to 
other relationships that you as a business owner may enter into. Uh, earlier, I touched on, you know, manufacturing relationships, um, distributors. Uh, all of these are relationships where you may be, you know, sharing certain information about your business as a necessity to conducting business with whoever this, this third party may be. And if they're collecting this valuable information, um, if you're not properly restricting them, they can then turn around and use that against you or share that information with your competitors um, for a fee. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can happen uh, because this, this information become, can become very valuable and you don't know when it's really going to gain that value. So it's and important here's the thing. To- None of this really is an issue until there's something that's super valuable because no one's fighting over the thing that doesn't matter. So I think that in my experience, I see a lot of times where people are kind of waving me off, like, um, not that you're making up a problem, but that you're maybe like embellishing how big of an issue this can become because when the business is new or um, in transition, you know, sometimes we see people who are selling a business that's been struggling to someone who has big plans to um, take it to the next level, then people are not really fussed about it because it's like, oh, it's just that thing. That's no big deal. Well, it's no big deal today, but it might be a big deal in the future. And that's not when you want to argue about it. <laughs> right. Once it's, right. once everyone agrees it's valuable, that's not when we want to be in a dispute about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dispute just becomes more uh, expensive. And, and I, I can appreciate that a, a new business owner with a startup, they are investing every penny they can into working capital to get this thing up and running. And it's not really attractive to invest all this money and agreements providing for restrictive covenants and, you know, having everything all buttoned up. They almost want to make sure that the business is actually going to go somewhere before they start investing in all those um, legal expenses. And I can certainly appreciate that. But what you can do with your attorney is at least get some baseline agreements in place. Um, Many of my clients, if they don't necessarily want to invest right away in an employment agreement or an independent contractor agreement, I say, that's fine. Let's at least get a blanket, you know, kind of standard agreement that you'll utilize with anybody that you're interacting with, who's going to get a peek at your business concepts, your plans, anything like that. Let's at least get them to sign a non-solicitation, non-disclosure agreement. Um, You don't have to, you know, you can kind of do these things in stages, but it's important to at least plan out and know that you're going to eventually get everything buttoned up before things get too valuable up. because then it's too, uh, too late. <laughs> the other thing is too, that I think people think this kind of stuff is fancy and that it applies to other types of businesses or bigger businesses. That's one thing. Uh, that's a term I hear bantered about quite a bit with, with business owners is they think that something is for a bigger business and, um, or a more profitable business. Sometimes they get tangled up with tax people who start talking about, um, you know, the size of the company based on its profits. Um, But there's oftentimes intellectual property that's incredibly valuable long before there's any profit in the company because R&D is so expensive, because the startup of these things, particularly when technology is involved, um, you know, the uh, success rates are not spectacular. So, you know, it's a lot of times dumping a bunch of money in um, and not having a return several times. And then all of a sudden um, you have something shoot through the moon. Uh, so I think sometimes be cautious if you're talking to your CPA, because for tax purposes, maybe the, the low profits are not interesting for planning. Um, but for legal purposes, a lot of these things are, are very much still an issue, even despite the fact that the business might be spending a loss. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of times I feel like, you know, you might get some advice from your CPA, but you're not really taking your tax advice from your attorney typically. Mm -hmm. And I don't recommend taking legal advice from a CPA (laughs) unless you have a dual CPA attorney like Joanne. Um, (laughs) But it's, it's also about the planning process and making sure that you at least have a plan in place for what you're going to be disclosing, how the business is going to be be developing, who you're going to be bringing on, things like that. Those are the the yeah. right questions to ask. And um, many times, folks think that oh, it's a it's just a, a new business venture. I'm just partnering with, with this person, and they think because it's not an employee or an independent contractor, they don't need to worry about these things. And that's 
absolutely not, not the case. So um, definitely want to just plan these things in advance. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on really, really quickly as well is trade secrets. And, you know, you need to think of trade secrets as being, they can be data, designs, recipes, really anything that's proprietary to your, to your business. And I caution clients to make sure that they're careful about who they're disclosing these trade secrets to, because there are certain protections that are provided under the non-disclosure covenants, but they only extend to what is deemed to be confidential. Uh, and if you're disseminating information and if it is reaching people outside of your employees and your independent contractors who are signing these restrictive covenants, it may be rendered um, unenforceable as a, as a restrictive covenant because the information may be deemed not to be confidential anymore. So it's really important to limit who you're sharing information about your internal operations, about your intangible assets, about really anything to do with your business to only those who are on a, on a need to know basis, because otherwise you could be compromising the integrity of, of the information being deemed confidential. So that's another, uh, another area where, where, um, you know, when, a, when a restrictive covenant is being enforced on someone, sometimes they um, have a hard time enforcing this mm -hmm. because of the fact that they've been a little too fast and loose and sharing some of their company information with even just friends and family members, yeah. because now it's out in the general public. So be, be cautious there. Um, Especially where the idea is cool or novel, you know, like it makes for good cocktail party chatter. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that is the perfect example. Yeah. You're at a cocktail party. You're excited about your idea. You just got a new investor and you, you know, the sky's the limit and you have a couple of glasses of wine and there, <laughs> there, there goes your confidential protection. Um, Do not take our legal advice wrong. We are not suggesting not to have a glass of wine or a no, few. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> just keep your, just keep it to, uh, you know, something else. Talk about anything else. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to caution folks about because I have seen Unfortunately, some people have a hard time enforcing those. Um, and also be careful what you're putting on social media. Yeah. So you might think, I'm not really giving them the full story. But if you are flirting with that line, something that you post on your website or in social media, yeah. that could be enough to compromise the confidentiality of that information. Yeah. Vague um, book doesn't always work. <laughs> no. And once it's out there, it's out there. Um, so just uh, be careful. The, um, the, other the other item I wanted to, to touch on as well is, again, going back to the fact that you need to make sure that your attorney is crafting these provisions based on the particular circumstances of these contracts. Um, some of the considerations that they need to be making and that your attorney will, I'm sure, make is looking at um, uh, legitimate business interests. That's one of the factors that the courts will look at is whether or not this restrictive covenant is actually crafted to protect a legitimate business interest. If you go beyond protecting what are actually your legitimate business interests for this particular business venture, then it could be deemed unenforceable. So if I had a restaurant before and this restrictive covenant was applicable to my restaurant and now I have some manufacturing design firm and I'm doing something completely different, or even if I'm doing something somewhat similar in my mind that seems somewhat similar, the restrictive covenant may still not be appropriate for this new business venture. So again, that just shows you why, um, you know, you have to look at these on a case by case basis. Um, the other item that you need to look at is what's reasonably necessary to protect that business interest. So you can't be overreaching with the restrictions that are being put in place to protect that business interest. Mm -hmm. um, also the, the scope of the activities that you're restricted, that you're restricting your employees or whoever the other party to the contract is, um, that needs to also contemplate the legitimate business interests. Um, obviously, the length of the restriction when we're talking about non-compete terms, that comes into play quite a bit. Where you know, if you're, if you have an employee, typically the the maximum non-compete term is going to be two years. If you're purchasing a business, it can be a bit longer, but you need to be careful how long you're imposing that restriction. Um, and you need to also make sure that you have certain savings clause, clauses baked into the contract where 
uh, they're, they're referred to as blue pencil provisions where the court can come in and strike certain provisions if they need to, um, to reform the restrictive covenant if they deem it to be unenforceable. Those typically are always going to be included in contracts, but that's just something you need to make sure is in place because part of enforcing these restrictive covenants is making sure that they are not overreaching. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes your attorney may be trying to offer the best possible protection, but they might take it a little too far and inadvertently void your, your restrictive covenant. So um, just another reason why, again, you need to get with your attorney ahead of time mm -hmm. and, and make sure that all these proper protections are in place. And you, you want to make sure that nothing is inked before yeah. these considerations are, are made. And as our good friend, Michael France says, if it feels good, you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I you think that, more. that extra length of time or extra geographical restriction, like, oh yeah, just take 50 more miles. Like if it feels good, you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's kind of the, the, high level overview of some of the common circumstances where I feel like my clients in particular, if you're, if you own a business, these are some considerations that you need to make. Um, and I, I would also say that, you know, we work hand in hand with employment attorneys and intellectual property attorneys um, to make sure that you get the broadest coverage of um, liability protection and asset protection and, ensuring that you're also gaining the legal title to the, the products and inventions and trademarks that you're investing all this time and money into because clients will spend years and even decades establishing mm -hmm. their customer base, their loyal employees and their skills. Um, and a lot of blood, sweat and tears and capital into producing their products and services, um, tangible and, 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 and intangible. So it's really important um, to not only protect that expensive equipment that you've invested money into, but also the know-how and processes and customer lists and web designs and what have you. Um, the list goes on and on. There's so many different other kinds of property that you need to look to protect. And the restrictive covenants are going to be your first line of defense to make sure you're not having things stolen out from under you. So those are my, uh, my thoughts on this for today. <laughs> That's a lot of thoughts. And uh, as always, they're all good and in depth. One thing that I um, also can say is sometimes people will um, shy away from these types of, of provisions because they throw their arms up and go, well, they're so hard to enforce. Like it's not even worth uh, writing them down. And I always, you know, Number one, you, if you're in a transaction like this, there's already lawyers, they're already drafting. You're not talking about a ton more money to button this up properly. Um, and if they're done well, they absolutely can be enforceable. You know, if, but I think all this stuff gets kind of lumped in with non-competes and people go, hey, you know, it doesn't matter anyways. And just be careful with that apathy because it's not necessarily um, well-founded. <laughs> I, think. I could not agree more. <laughs> you know, they're in there for a reason. Um, Jackie frequently says, you know, we're not being paid by the word here. So it's not, uh, <laughs> we're not just trying to find something to, to throw into the agreement to make it longer. So no, there's, there's a, there is a purpose behind all of that legalese that you see in the contract. And you're like, really, do we really need to have all this in here? Can we please Jackie cut some of this fat? And yeah. I always explain that there is a purpose for all of these. And there's, there's no hundreds fat. of thousands of dollars in litigation that goes behind that, that, that has preceded these clauses. They're in there now for a reason um, because there's been so much litigation over them. And, you know, it, it's always best to be clear about what you expect. And um, unfortunately, what I, I, I tend to find my clients learning some of these lessons the hard way on the back end of things. And, um, you know, they tend to appreciate my, uh, my cautious approach a little bit more in the next transaction because they've been burned in, in prior transactions and in prior business relationships. So it's, um, it's, it's, yes, a little bit more of an investment and time and, and expense to craft provisions properly and have all these agreements in place in advance. But man, will it save you money on the back end? It's no different than an insurance policy. It really yeah. is not. Yeah, that's why not? 
if you can make it a little bit better, it's like a vitamin, just in case, if it's a little bit better, you may as well, cause you're in there digging around anyways. So, well, thank you so much once again, um, as always very helpful. And, um, you know, this is the side of things that isn't quite, um, as obvious, you know, these, these problems come up and people don't realize that they can be problems until they've had a problem. Um, so we're here for problem avoidance and we've seen lots of people have problems. So before you fall into the, uh, <laughs> into the, into the landmine, we try to try to stop people from doing that. But, um, as always, we're happy to, uh, have your requests for other topics that you'd like to hear about. We do record all of our webinars and distribute them on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page, and on our, on our websites, coonsassociates.com and coonsparkin.com. Um, if this wasn't fun enough, you can join us next week. And we're going to be talking about LLC considerations for rental properties. So I'm sure Marina will throw some tax uh, into that as well because she can't help it. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much, Jackie, for all your help with all things corporate all the time. Have a great My weekend. Everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.